You are listening to one of my favorite rock groups in the world. I'm dating myself. Creedence Clearwater Revival. Plain, I put a spell on you, which I thought was probably an appropriate theme for the session this afternoon. I put a spell on you, the business roundtable statement of purpose. And uh, as you can tell, I'm a little bit cynical about what the business roundtable did. Uh, I have been advocating like Tim Yeomans, that board should publish a company-specific stakeholder-inclusive statement of purpose. They really believe in stakeholder capitalism. I was enthused when the Business Roundtable came out with their statement. I thought, well, you know, the dam is broken on all of these concerns around fiduciary duty, so it shouldn't be so hard to get the start publishing a specific statement of purpose. And to date, the count is zero. One year later, the count is zero. I've written an open letter to the Business Roundtable uh, inviting them to uh, all publish a statement. I've heard nothing yet. I'm going to talk about purpose, and this is basically a deep drill down into uh, some of the topics that were raised in the opening plenary session, which I thought was excellent. Uh, the format is each of my distinguished speakers will take about five minutes and give their comments and views, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, assuming that I can figure out how Q&A works in this magic virtual land of Remo, my first experience with Remo. Um, the speakers will, when they give their remarks, start by giving their background. And with that, let's just jump into it. And I'd like to start with my good friend, Leela Carbasi. Um, you deal with lots of companies, Leela, so tell us about what you do at the Global Compact. And do you think I'm being, that there's more kind of greenwashing, more words than actions around statement of purpose, or do you see some positive movement out there in all the companies you deal with around the world? Great. Thanks, Bob, and good afternoon, everyone, and, and great to be part of the session. Uh, the answer is it depends. Um, never too cynical. Um, it's good to be a bit cynical, but uh, I think there is some positive news out there, so I'll get to that uh, in a moment. Um, I think it's a very timely discussion to uh, to have on corporate purpose just one year after the Business Roundtable issued its statement. Uh, the momentum has been building on, building on redefining the role of, of companies. And at the same time now, we're um, in a place where everything is possible. Um, we can rethink the economy and there's that unique window of opportunity for, for change. Um, I think the pandemic has been a, a wake up call to all of us, a wake up call um, to see how hard we can be hit by a global crisis, uh, a wake up call on the massive inequalities around us, um, and also a wake up call on how unprepared we are uh, to face uh, this type of disruption. Um, there are three aspects that I like in the debate around uh, corporate purpose um, that resonate with the work that we do at the Global Compact. Uh, first, it's about radical transparency. Tell me about your intentions. Tell me about why you're doing what you're doing, your strategy, your governance. Second, it's about inclusiveness and moving beyond just the engagement of shareholders, but um, getting to a broad set of stakeholders. And then thirdly, um, it's about moving uh, from pure compliance to um, advocacy and standing up for a particular purpose in society, contributing to the well-being of people, contributing to the planet, contributing to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, I'm just coming back um, from a briefing this morning on the latest uh, science and modeling around climate change. And I participate in quite a lot of those, but every time I'm shocked to see that unfortunately we're still following the worst case scenario under the IPCC models. And uh, going beyond two degree warming is gonna bring us to uncharted territory. Um, so what needs to be done is reduced by half every 10 years, our level of emission. Ironically, this year, this was the year that we were supposed to reduce um, for the first time the global emissions. And because of the downturn, unfortunately, um, you know, the downturn that, that is happening right now, we're on track to reduce 7.5% 
in 2020. Not sure if we're going to be on track in 2021, if the levels of investments that are taking place right now are going to lock us into um, technologies that would increase CO2 emissions. But uh, right now we're, we're on track, but it's been at a very, very hard cost um, for everybody and for the economy. Uh, the general reaction that uh, we see from companies that we work with is um, an intention to use the crisis as an opportunity to prepare better uh, for the future. We've seen an increase both in the membership of the Global Compact, as well as the engagement of companies in the Global Compact. And the same thing goes for the science-based target initiative, which we co-founded um, other organizations. So companies are um, aiming to look long term um, and uh, to move beyond this sort of business as usual. And I think the formulation of corporate purpose is critical um, in the sustainability journey that uh, companies are on. And it's, it perfectly fits into um, the debate today about redefining the role of, um, of companies or corporations in the economy um, and um, ultimately, you know, having the full buying of the board, the board of directors, the executive management, shareholders, investors, um, and linking this purpose to the strategy of the company. So. I would say uh, it's it's um, disappointing to see that there are very few companies that are deliberate about uh, their corporate purpose. I've witnessed some sectors um, that have been embracing this topic already a few years ago. If you look at uh, transportation and uh, reformulating this sector under mobility, that's I think a good example of shifting uh, the mindsets around that. So there. Some good um, elements out there, some some you know encouraging trends, but still a long way to go. So um, let me ask you a quick provocative question. I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Andrew. So Leela, you seem to be a, a glass half full type of person, and I'm feeling like a glass is half empty type of person today, as you can tell. Um, We've had conversations about how few major listed U.S. companies are members of the Global Compact. So you said, you know, you're getting more membership. Um, how's that going? Are there many business roundtable members that are members of the Global Compact? You talk about boards, if there's boards, why isn't there a statement of purpose? If there was movement of business roundtable companies joining the Global Compact, I might be a little mollified. Is that true or not? Or are they still holdouts for the most part? The U.S. market is not the easiest market um, for us at the Compact. Um, however, um, we have, as part of the Global 500 companies, about um, half of them that are part of the Compact, and many of them are American companies, large companies. So um, the business roundtable signatories, um, I don't have the exact number of the uh, 186 um, to know how many are part of the glo global compact, but my guess would be about 50% um, of those would be compact uh, signatories. Um, the increase in membership that we see is um, slow but steady. Um, so, you know, as any organization, we were reflecting on our you know our our strategy our path forward during the covid crisis and we're quite uh, concerned about uh, engagement and we saw the opposite effect of more companies joining at a higher rate than before consistent with our uh, projections in the past but no slowdown across all markets and uh, a genuine desire particularly on climate change uh, to have clear targets in place, targets aligned with 1.5, and to have the validation um, that uh, underpins the credibility of the targets and a need to rush the validation of the targets to, you know, to have, to have a, a better foundation for any sort of advocacy um, out there. Well, that's good. It's better than I thought. So thank you for that. So let's get an investor perspective. Andrew, you've got to turn on your mic. So, um, so tell us, Andrew, tell us who you are 
and you've got a little surprise you can reveal at some point, you know, when you'd want to. And and what's the invest investor perspective on whether companies are taking purpose more seriously or not? Right. Well, thanks, Bob. Um, so I'm Andrew Parr. I'm head of sustainable investment at Newton Investment Management in London. So we're part of the BMY Mellon Group. So we're one of the investment subsidiaries. Um, I've been in, in the investment industry now for 35 years, always as a sort of a hands-on bottom-up stock picker. So it's always thinking about things like sustainability, ESG and corporate purpose through the lens of actually what companies are doing. Um, so for me, I was really interested in the, the, in the Business Roundtable statement last year of, of purpose and, and reframing it in stakeholders, not so much for what they were actually doing, but for why now? And, I, and I've been sort of, I guess I've been pondering on that, uh, you know, why big American corporations have suddenly decided to embrace or seemingly embrace stakeholder uh, approach over the primacy of the shareholder, or well, maybe it should be the primacy of the CEO. I think in, in the US we we might have had a might have even got uh, Friedman slightly wrong. Um, and for me, the way I've been thinking about the world and thinking about the notion of purpose and how it frames is that we're in a world of accelerating and rapid change and transition. It's you know it's assailing every business. This was pre-COVID, post-COVID, we're only seeing that accelerate. So we're seeing transitions socially, we're seeing transitions in the climate, uh, we're seeing transitions in technology, geopolitics, uh, uh, de uh, demographics, all of which are really assailing the notion of business as usual. And, and I always felt that a lot of the reason for big corporations beginning to think about the notion of stakeholders and talking about purpose is a recognition that for many of them, the next decade is going to be a challenge for remaining relevant in this rapidly changing world. Uh, and, and I think that that's one way I try to frame about thinking about sort of corporate purpose from the investor perspective is one, actually how do companies see their role in navigating this world in, in a series of complex and uncertain transitions. And then from the investor perspective, by setting out the purpose, it's not so much that purpose itself is a route to automatic corporate success. And that, that just can't be, be that way. There are so many other influences and factors that will determine success. Um, but it's a way for shareholders to begin to hold people to account. And I think accountability is going to be a, a really important part of that. And I suspect that part of the reason, Bob, why you have, you've got less people than you would like, or maybe zero is certainly less than you would like, adopting a purpose statement is that not many of them want to particularly be held to account for, for the statement. And, and I look at the, the, the statement and I look at the comments around uh, stakeholders, and actually when you read it, it is particularly post-COVID, is actually quite a good framework for saying to companies, look, you, you've talked about treating your workers with, with dignity and respect, providing them with education and benefits. So what are you doing about it? Actually, where is the evidence? What, you know, what is the manifestation of this? How have you behaved in, uh, in the management of your supply chain? Or how have you uh, worked with communities in the recovery from COVID? So, so for me, that, that's one of the key elements. It, it's about holding them to account. Um, it's, it's easy to have a statement, uh, but it's the accountability and the ownership of that statement that, that, that's, uh, I think, going to be really important. And, you know, it's, it, it raises important questions then. If you have a, um, a statement about purpose and you're an active lobbyer for specific interests, how do you balance lobbying uh, with um, broader purpose and other stakeholders. Um, and, and so I think it, it, part of any purpose statement is a recognition of the challenges uh, and the limitations uh, that all companies have to deal with. And you, as you, you said, my big reveal um, is big you, reveal. Yeah, I've been working with you uh, uh, on and off over the years. And yeah, we wrote our own corporate purpose statement, which we actually uh, pub we published today at Newton. And I tell you, it was a lot harder 
thinking about it and turning it into something real than I ever thought it would be. Um, but it's a great exercise. And I think more than just an external statement for how our clients can hold us to account and what they should expect of us, I think it's equally important as what it represents internally and a series of values and behaviors and expectations that we put on ourselves, some that we do now, some that we, we acknowledge that we need to do better than we should do in the future. But it's also something that should transcend who's running the business today. And it should be about something that gives us some route map for, for us in the future. So I, I find it a really illuminating experience to do it. I have a question for you on that, and then we'll move to Roberto. Um, so, you know, I'm very enthusiastic. It's interesting, you're an investment management firm um, and you're one of the asset managers in BNY Mellon's overall business. You invest in companies, you engage with companies. To what extent do you think the fact that, that Newton has published the statement of purpose itself gives you the moral high ground, gives you credibility, gives you experience to say to the companies whose stock you own, we think it was good for us and we think it would be good for you. Do you think it will make is it a persuasive argument or do you think they'll still resist or not independently of what you've done? But I think when we're asking for something, if you've done it yourself, then, you know, you, I don't know about taking the moral high ground, but you can actually say this is something that we believe in, this is something that we see as a value and this is the value that we see to our organization and why we think it's important that your organization, especially if you've signed the BRT, um, um, a statement that you 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 produce one. I mean, explain. Uh, you know, puts me in a position to be able to explain what I think the benefits are. Um, I'm certainly not going to take the moral high ground. And that's guarantees I get shot down pretty damn quickly. But um, you know, I think it is a, a useful debating point. You know, we've debated uh, purpose with um, you know, companies already, and uh, it's good to say that you've taken it seriously in your own organisation. So when you made the reference and you were talking about Milton Friedman and you made the reference to CEOs in your typically nice, polite, oblique British way, Andrew, <laughs> that, you know, the, the corporation exists to serve CEOs. I couldn't help but think of Roberto's paper with his colleague, Lucian Babchuk, where Roberto's probably sitting here thinking, you guys are talking about all the wrong stuff. It's like, you know, the stakeholder capitalism that's the wrong way to be thinking about it anyway, because he wrote this lovely paper with Lucian, The Illusory Promise of Stakeholder Capitalism, and they do have data on CEOs. So, Roberto, you know I love your paper. I don't necessarily agree with all of it, but I think you make some excellent points. Let me turn it over to you. I'd love for you to tell people what you and Lucian have done and what your views are and kind of how this whole debate should move forward. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Bob, and uh, uh, to the other uh, speakers. Uh, I will use uh, my time to make basically two points very briefly. And uh, as, as Bob said, uh, Lucian Babichek and I have this recent paper, The Illusory Promise of Stakeholder Governance, where we analyze stakeholderism. And uh, uh, we think, we conclude, first of all, the stakeholderism, the stakeholderism proposed by the Business Roundtable and by others, uh, which basically means giving uh, corporate leaders discretionary power to weigh and balance the interest of and other stakeholders is unlikely to produce benefits for stakeholders. This is my point number one. Point number two is that stakeholderism, in fact, can hurt stakeholders and society at large. Let me briefly go over our arguments and if we have time, we can delve into the, some of details. So point number one, stakeholderism will not produce benefits for stakeholders. That's what we, we believe. Why? Because directors and CEOs do not have the right incentives to produce benefits for stakeholders. Uh, this is a key question that is often not made explicit in this conversation. What economic forces shape the behavior and the decisions of corporate leaders? In our view, the right place to look for an answer is the structure of the CEO and director's incentives. So first of all, the labor market and the corporate control market. There's ample evidence that 
uh, uh, improving share value, being friendly to shareholders, and for directors also being friendly to CEOs, as Andrew pointed out, uh, uh, increases the chances for directors and CEOs to keep their job or to find comparable or better jobs in other companies. So they have a pretty strong incentive to increase share value. They do not have similar incentives or mechanism to be nice to stakeholders, to care about the welfare of stakeholders. Compensation. Compensation is a powerful tool to incentivize directors and CEOs towards certain goals. We are looking at this. We have some data in the paper and we are expanding our research. We have been looking at the signatories of the BRT st uh, statement on corporate, on corporate purpose and we found that very few companies use ESG goals in CEO compensation and uh, those that do use those goals, the, the metrics are often uh, qualitative or can be discretionally adjusted or revised by the compensation committee. So there are very few companies that use quantifiable, verifiable ESG metrics for compensation. And those few that use those metrics, uh, the, the weight for the, the total pay of CEO is, is, pretty, is pretty small. So incentives matter. Directors and CEOs have strong reasons to take the interests of shareholders into account. They have very few or no reason to care about stakeholders. In fact, they uh, do not have reason to benefit stakeholders beyond the point which is good for stock value. And that is the key question, uh, whether we are talking about an instrumental stakeholderism, meaning uh, I'm, I'm nice to stakeholders as long as it, this is good for profits, or we're talking about something more pluralistic, about caring about multiple constituencies. I'll make briefly another point. Uh, we do believe that this version of stakeholders, which is the version that most people talk about, giving discretion to management to create, uh, uh, advance their uh, stakeholder-oriented purpose uh, can actually hurt stakeholders. Uh, first of all, this, this approach will likely weaken the power of shareholders to keep management accountable. As Andrew said, accountability is key. And with the excuse of stakeholderism, <clears throat> management can make decisions that are justified uh, in the interests of some constituencies but it's not clear to whom they will be accountable, legally speaking. Uh, second, uh, acceptance of the, what we believe is an illusory promise of stakeholderism can dis divert energies and resources of advocates away from more promising tools like uh, environmental regulation or labor regulation, other uh, regulatory and policy reforms that may have some teeth and actually bring about some real protection to stakeholders. Relying on managerial discretion can distract people from the, uh, from the main goal. So uh, in conclusion, uh, our conclusion, which is a little bit cynical, pessimistic, as you said, Bob, uh, stakeholderism, at least uh, uh, framed this way, uh, should be rejected, especially by those who care about corporate negative externalities and stakeholder welfare. So I think you make some good points. The incentives and compensation is important. And there's the underlying issue about just what the corporate form is of legal structure. And, and that's going to come up. You mentioned regulation. I'm going to turn it over to Adam next, who was on the plenary panel, because he's got a strong background in regulation. But before I do that, um, Roberto, because this just reinforced my cynicism, so I love you guys for this. Tell us about the little survey that you did. Oh, right. The business roundtable signatories, the question that you asked them and the response that you got. I think it's just, it's so revealing. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, I can't say uh, we were completely surprised, right, because we, we, we are at least, a, uh, we were at least as skeptical as you are. 
uh, we actually reached out to um, almost all U.S. Uh, 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 signatories of the BRT statement, a total of 173 companies, and we asked who approved the statement. Was it the board or was it just a CEO or a, a, a public relation of this initiative? And 48 companies got back to us, and only one out of 48 said that the board approved the BRT statement. So, uh, you know, even the most imperial CEOs seek board approval for a major decision like this. They may try to nudge or push the board, uh, but they will not ignore it. So uh, the most plausible explanation, in our view, uh, for this lack of board approval is that the CEO themselves did not view the statement as a major change, let alone a revolutionary moment, as many newspapers said. Uh, so this is quite striking. Uh, with just one company out of the 48 that responded uh, had board approval for the business roundtable statement. That's, you know, they're changing or they're saying they're changing or revolutionizing the purpose of the corporation. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, you, you got to wonder, right? I mean, there's all this fanfare. It says, oh, this is our first major change and view on the role of the corporation since our 1997 white paper. And we've gone away from, you know, shareholder right. focus. I mean, gee, you probably want a, something that big a deal. You want to run it by your board, right? Well, no, Andrew's Absolutely. right. And we have imperial CEOs. No, I'm the CEO. It's good enough. Then, so that's amusing to me. The other thing that's amusing to me is you go to these guys and you say, well, why didn't you run it by your board? Well, you know, it wasn't a problem. We've been doing purpose for decades. That's what you hear now. Oh, we've been doing purpose forever. And I'm like, right. oh, right. Yeah, you've been doing it forever. And you just decided that now is the time that you want to talk about it. But um, I should I should quit venting. Adam, Roberto talked about regulation. You actually know something about it. You know, you worked in state government. Would love to get your views on that. Um, I read your blog. I thought it was excellent. How do you see all of this? No, thank you, Bob, and thanks to everyone for having me here. I, for those of you uh, who weren't on the planet, I had a fortune doing double duty here. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Uh, I'm Adam Zarovsky. I am uh, still a recovering lawyer by training. For uh, about 18 years of my career, I represented boards in some of the types of situations we're talking about here: crisis management at, against at, activist investors, all that sort of stuff. Um, I couldn't help, I'll, I'll come back to my comments in a second, but in response to Roberto's survey, I couldn't help but just smile and just sort of picture the conversation with the CEO and the general counsel about whether or not we should go to the board here. And the word that's in my head is, this is a PR exercise. That, and, and if it was you know classified that way by some of them, it just goes there. But we'll come back to that in a minute. So uh, I then uh, spent a couple of years, as, as Bob mentioned, uh, here in the state of New York, uh, first running our financial regulation and energy and climate portfolios, and then all state policy for Governor Cuomo until last year. I now had a nonprofit uh, committed to climate policy and electrification in particular called Rewiring America. Um, I come at these issues, as I think I mentioned yesterday, from the, I'll call it the policymaker perspective, but it's also with a, sla uh, with a, with a, with a splash of uh, philosophy, and that is this. Uh, a lot of us talk about the purpose of corporations, and, and most of the time that conversation occurs within the particular corporation? What is the purpose of this corporation? What is you know, the statement that we should put out about our purpose? Um, I, I tend to look at this first as the question of what is the purpose of corporations as, in, as an institution? They are, after all, a social institution. I, I think I said this yesterday, I joked about it before. You know, Moses did not come down the mountain from his talk with God with the Delaware General Business Laws on the tablets. This is something we created as a society to serve a purpose. And so the, like any social institution and any particularly powerful one like this, um, it, I think, behooves us, and in this case, the us is um, society large, but writ through, writ through policymaking, uh, to ask, well, why did we create that thing? Are they serving that purpose? Uh, and would we do it the same way again? And we could start over. And so I think when you come at it from that perspective, uh, I think a couple things follow that are relevant to this conversation. Uh, the first is, um, I, and I did write a post, as, as Bob references, on, on the BRT statement when it came out, and, and I think what I took issue with there was not so much the BRT, the sentiment behind it, but almost the structural question, which is, and this goes to Roberto's point, why is it that the CEOs of these 180 something companies get to decide what their purpose should be writ large, right? I mean, in some sense, 
Uh, sure, they and they by definition have to because they're running the companies and they have to be the ones who, you know, execute a vision and identify and execute a vision. But when it comes to the broader question of the whole business roundtable talking about the purpose of the corporation, it, it struck me as a bit odd, and it strikes me still as a bit odd that that's not a conversation that has a broader buy-in, a broader perspective. And that perspective, again, is looking at the all the net social utility of the corporate enterprise as an institution. And that brings up the conversation of externalities, right? Robert, we're talking here really about externalities. And I think when people talk about stakeholder capitalism, at some level, they're talking about a proxy for dealing with the externalities, the negative externalities primarily that are the uh, consequence of corporate action, right? And and the, the negative externalities on workers, on, on the environment, on uh, social arrangements, on, on supply chains, whatever it might be. And stakeholder capitalism, I think, is a, is a has been a uh, you know movement that's gained attraction as a way to try to get our arms around that question. Another way, obviously, as Roberto referenced, would be direct regulation. But I'm and I'll I have some ideas on that, as Bob mentioned. I, I'll try to get them in in a second. But I'm a little. I think before we get to specific regulation, we should think about more structural purpose because regulation is sort of you know you catch it's the rules of the road and it's what you catch the bad guy doing when he cuts his hand in the cookie jar. I think what we want to think about is how do we structurally encourage corporations not to create those negative externalities in the first place. And I think that's why the BRT and stakeholder capitalism is, is a welcome development, but it is still a limited one. It's one that to me does not go far enough in recognizing that corporations are fundamentally social institutions and that you know we as society should have a say in that. And that could mean redrawing what it means to be a, co a company. Right now, all 50 states, it's basically you have to engage in any legal purpose. So the mafia is out, but it basically every other activity is in. I think we can think better about that. I'm looking at my friend Rick Alexander, who obviously spent a lot of time at the B Corp movement, and, and that's sort of what they're getting at. This is a, embedded in the nature of what it means to be a corporation and a recognized as such. So I, I work on those issues, and I think that's important. Um, I think that regulation is important too, but I think the regulation is sort of horse out of the barn kind of approach as opposed to trying to get the horse to behave in the first place, and that's where we should be. So with that in mind, I guess a couple of regulatory um, ideas uh, or, or projects in which I certainly have an interest and I think, you know, might, might help out here. Uh, it's rather than trying to jam, um, we, we, all, we all know, we're all familiar with the obviously increased disclosures around uh, corporate behaviors that have come out from the great work that SASB has done, that CDP, DRI, all the great work that's been done over the last, last recent years. Um, one of the ideas I had when I was back with Governor Cuomo was instead of, you know, trying to focus and jam disclosure and information about companies and therefore and the externalities that they create into the framework of an investor lens, why don't we create parallel frameworks? Why don't we have broader disclosure? That is to say, you want to be a, a company operating in New York. New York values are things like equal pay for equal work, uh, human rights along supply chains, minimizing your impact on the climate. You want to come here in New York? You should disclose to us some pretty simple metrics around and, and, and therefore to everyone in the state who does business and interacts with you, what it is you do on those things? It doesn't have to be tied to materiality of investment. It's just something we're interested in as society, as the society that's giving you the limited liability and license to operate. We want to know some things about you. And so I think that if we were to get out of the mindset a little bit of investor-centric disclosure and broader disclosure, I think we could probably perhaps move some of them, you know, put more accountability on uh, corporations around these metrics. So that's one area in which I've certainly been active and think is interesting. Another is this, and this has really been highlighted by the COVID situation, and that is um, we all know the problem of share buybacks and the, and the issues that's created. Um, if nothing else, the fact that 30 million people in one month were laid off of the American pay uh, roll uh, in the COVID, in wake of COVID, and I, I don't really care what the precipitating causes, that's an unbelievable statistic. Uh, and it tells you right away that these were not these companies and corporations in this country were not built for resiliency to withstand shocks. They instead, the model is we're going to lay these people off, outsource that problem to society to step in with, um, you know, unemployment and other protections. Um, and so one question in one area is, is should as consistent with the notion of corporations as social institutions, should they be allowed to function and do their business and make their profits, but also have some level of reserve that allows them to absorb and be a part of helping guard against the worst of the so negative externalities. I know the example I give having regulated the insurance industry for a while is insurance reserves. 
we require insurance companies to keep minimum reserves. Why? Because in case, you know, they, we know we want them around. We see that as that minimum level as a public good. And given that corporations are, of course, publicly licensed and, 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 and creatures of society, um, you know, we, we could do the same. The trade-off there would be less capital to deploy, would produce presumably less profit and perhaps less innovation. But that's a gauge and that's, again, a, a, a utility measurement that, that I think we as society and policymakers should be having that conversation and should make that calculation. It shouldn't be up to the companies themselves to decide that. It should be how much, how do we want to see these institutions in their overall role in social utility? And is it is, is it akin to the more insurance model, like a public good? Or is it just Let's go for it and we'll worry about externalizing the costs later. I, I think the former, but that's again, um, obviously while we're, while we're, while we're all, why we're all here to discuss. I guess so quick I'll question for you, Adam, and I'm gonna turn it over to my friend, Rick. So Roberto, I think made a good point, um, you know, in their paper about um, one of the challenges with stakeholder capitalism is that that's not really what CEOs are being rewarded for. Very few ESG metrics are being yes. taken into account in compensation. So. If we took your model and let's say that companies were reporting on the externalities and um, their compensation was tied to that, mm -hmm. do you think that would resolve the problem that Roberto was talking about? Or do you think the way the system is set up now and the fiduciary duty directors have around the traditional C Corp would really mitigate the extent to which that reporting and trying to tie incentives to those metrics would make a difference or not? So it's a great question. Um, I think it would help. I mean, I, I think I should say that the disclosure, the expanded disclosure regime I'm talking about, I see as, um, you know, a, a piece of policy that has a realistic chance of being implemented in the short term. I mean, if you ask me, I would go back to Tabula Rasa and start thinking about questions around, should all corp, should we only have B Corp statute? I mean, it's kind of an act of, just to, just to say it, it's almost an act of chance that the original and, and, and the structure, at least in the United States, because we have all 50 states in their race to the bottom, that we have this thing, fiduciary duty. There's no rule that says that that's how it has to be. It could have been just as easily that the B Corp uh, model that, that Rick and his colleagues have been advocating was the was the one and only that came up to be is how corporations grew. So if you ask me, I would go back to that fundamental basis, but within the confines of what we're dealing with now and, and, and in terms of trying to get incrementalism uh, in its best sense, uh, I certainly think a broader disclosure metric would do two things. One is it would provide information, meaningful information to employees about work, who have choice about working for companies, to customers who have choice about dealing with companies, about regulators, to regulators who have choice about, you know, using their discretion for regulatory or uh, prosecution. And I think also it would kind of go a long way to blow up this myth that the only constituency that really matters at the end of the day is shareholders. And, and, and that, to me is a social as well, it's a, it's a formal legal hurdle, but it's also a social one. And it's why I think so often um, we see these disclosure regimes trying to fit their ways into uh, investor disclosure. It reflects the end day that everybody knows investors hold the, hold the keys. I think moving away from that requires us to move away both formally, but also uh, sociologically. And I think it would help to have that kind of disclosure out there and people blogging about it and to social media about it and all this sort of stuff to get uh, companies to kind of become a little bit more broader view, viewpoint accountable. So thanks. I mean, Rick disappeared. He Please knows start. how to make an exit, that guy. He knows what he's you doing. You know, he, he left the table. He's entered the table. Rick, where, my gosh, Rick. I mean, it's important that, that Rick be here. So, so Rick, you're back. Um, Rick is another um, corporate lawyer looking for redemption. And I will be sending both you, Adam and Rick, an invoice at the end of this session to Thank me for helping you clear your conscience in this public way. I will just say we tried to do it ourselves together. Rick's guest lectured in my class before, and we have a little huddle around. Uh, you know, we're not such bad guys when we do. That's it. right. We're, we're we're nice people after all. But in all seriousness, I think what what Rick has done and is doing is really it gets at the fundamental issues, right? I mean, you're right, Adam. Corporations are social institutions. They're social constructs. So are investors. So is the economy, for that matter. Um, so, Rick, I think you're kind of looking at this in its most fundamental sense. Let me turn it over to you for your views and tell us about what you're doing now with your great new initiative. Well, thanks very much, uh, Bob. Thanks to everybody. And I'll apologize because although I'm a recovering lawyer, I'm also a not so technical person. So I actually didn't hear a word Adam said. Uh, as my, it was all pretty bad. It's all, <laughs> so I may, I may end up repeating something. You've heard all before, though. That's the problem. I may I may end up repeating some of it, but you know, there's a, 
I just want to say that, um, you know, when the BRT statement came out, I was not especially hopeful. Um, you know, there was a big flurry and within a week they put out, you know, people said this is the end of, you know, uh, business world because terrible things will happen. And others said, well, this is just what companies have been doing all along. Um, and, and sort of in reaction, they put out a set of FAQs, um, you know, one of the FAQs said, well, what happens when the interest of the shareholders and the interest of the stakeholders diverge? And the BRT's answer was, well, don't worry, that never happens. They're the same in the long run, which is just to say, this is a meaningless statement and we didn't really mean it. But by the way, we all know those interests do diverge. Um, another little example, just I'll, I'll talk about is Wells Fargo signed that statement, although they signed it late. Um, Within two months of signing that statement, they got a shareholder proposal asking that they become a Delaware Public Benefit Corporation. That's a corporation that specifically says in its charter, uh, we're gonna we're gonna set the interests of stakeholders at the same level as the interests of shareholders. And they said the, the, the proposal was that they study that proposal. What 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 Wells Fargo did so they wouldn't have to face that proposal at their meeting was they quickly went out and they got a study. So that they could say to the SEC, we've already complied with this proposal. They did that, and the study said, I kid you not, um, they got a, a Delaware law firm to write a, an opinion that said, well, you shouldn't do this because if you did, and the interest of your shareholders and your stakeholders diverged, you wouldn't know what to do because there would be no rule, like the simple rule that there is now for a regular corporation that you go with the interest of the shareholders. So completely contrary to that FAQ. Um, and, and I think the point is that, and I, I, I think I'm just repeating what just about every other panelist has said to some extent, is that's not a serious statement. And, and I think the, the thing that's going on here is really, I think, what Adam got at, which is corporations have a purpose in general. We create corporations that have a purpose. And, and look, I'm a capitalist. I think you know, their purpose is to create value. And I also think that profit is a pretty good heuristic for value. I mean, Adam Smith, when he sort of described the, the bread maker saying, you know, you got, a, you got a nice loaf of bread, not because the baker's a good guy, but because he could buy flour and hire a, a worker and put it all together and, you know, have some change left over. So he, he had to do it. And the profit incentive is a great purpose. The problem is that when we went and Sure, I haven't talked about this. When we went from having specific corporations that had specific purposes to saying, hey, let's just incorporate anybody who wants to make a profit, we forgot that there's also bad ways to make profits. And I think what we're trying, I'm, I'm at an organization called the Shareholder Commons. What we're trying to do is to go back to the asset owners. And I think this addresses some of the thing in Roberto's and Lucian's paper. We're trying to go back to the asset owners and remind them that although profit is nice, and it's nice when the companies in your portfolio make profits, if you are a diversified shareholder, and if you represent human beings, you're actually more stakeholder than shareholder with respect to any one company. Because if one company tries to make a profit, not by creating value, but by exploiting the commons, by using more carbon from the carbon budget than is permissible, or by extent, continuing to extend the crippling inequality uh, that, we're, that our world is, is, is full of. Um, you, you, know, you, you might make some money from that company, but your portfolio is going to suffer under the long run. Because what happens is all this, all this profit producing activity by shareholders is creating you know, what I'm talking about, external costs and those costs are creating systemic risk, risk to the environment, risk to our economy, risk to society. And as an investor, those systemic risks become systematic to your portfolio, you can, meaning you cannot diversify away from them. You can't, you can't divest away from climate change because the problem isn't simply stranded assets at a single company. The problem is that a four degree world is going to be insufferable um, and companies aren't going to be able to make money. So what we'd like to, to do is see asset owners and asset managers and all the people around them 
start to focus on their number one job not being producing alpha by individual companies, but rather preserving systems by making sure that all of the companies in their portfolio are competing for profits, but only profits that come from efficiency and innovation, not profits that come from exploitation. Um, and at the shareholder commons, we have a bunch of initiatives uh, to try to make that happen. So let me ask you a kind of pointed question. And we've got some questions coming in from the audience. I remember, Rick, when we first met, uh, at least one of the first times we were on a panel together, it was, I think, in the MSCI building back in the olden days where people did things in person. And you were talking about benefit corporations. And I'm thinking, this guy's out to lunch, right? I mean, I can't even get companies to do integrated reporting, and he wants them all to become benefit corporations. So, I mean, who is this guy? Um, he's trying to get redemption too quickly, too soon as a lawyer. But I gotta admit, I'm around. So like I'm now at the point of view, I don't think that this kind of positive incrementalism is gonna work at the system level. I think the points that Roberto made are good. So I'm kind of doubling down on the Delaware Public Benefit Corporation that just because we've had the C Corp for some number of decades, the way Adam was defining it, doesn't mean we should keep doing it. So my question is, do you think we can get to where we need to be from this kind of shareholder common externality system level perspective do you think we can do it with really genuine incrementalism with the corporate form as it is today or do you think no we're not going to get there until we redefine the corporate form to a delaware public benefit corporation or its analogy yeah so i don't i genuinely don't know the answer to that question i think the key that for all this to work you need to change the mindset of asset owners and, and, and therefore asset managers who work for them. Um, I think as you move forward on that, you may find that it will be very helpful to that process to change the governance of corporations, either through litigation that redefines shareholder primacy to mean what is good for shareholders as a whole, not what is good for particular theoretical concentrated shareholder in my company, but an even faster way to get there is to begin pressuring companies to become benefit corporations. And I think there's very good reasons to do that. Um, you know, again, people have sort of emphasized today that, that you know, in a, in a rapidly heating world where now COVID shows us that actually you should believe science or bad things will happen. Um, I think there's an opportunity uh, for, for pressure, whether it's from, shareholders or customers or workers to push companies to demonstrate uh, that they're doing the right thing and also to protect their directors when their directors want to very vocally um, look after the interest of stakeholders or shareholders in the broad sense I referenced earlier, uh, you know, without the threat of, of liability. So I think there's an important place for benefit corporation conversion as an important element of this movement, whether it's absolutely necessary, I, I don't know. I mean, one of the things I like about it, then I'm gonna to go to Jacqueline's question, and this is a conversation that you and Leo and I have been having with Tim some, is that um, the Delaware Public Benefit Corporation sort of kept the authenticity of both companies and investors. Because if a company wants to do it, they need, as I understand it now, a majority vote um, through the changes in the Delaware legislature. So. There's all this talk of, from investment community, BlackRock, Larry Fink, I'm waiting for their statement of purpose, their listed company, come on, Larry. Um, you know, it's the point to, that Andrew was making. So a company comes out and then the shareholders have to say, yeah, they're gonna have to approve it. So, but we need some examples and we don't have any yet. So Jackson asked a good question, could with shareholder resolutions defining corporate purpose, so shareholder resolutions, they're not quite litigation, uh, defining corporate purpose, push boards to write their own statement. So let me have one of the lawyers pick that up. Is that a way to get statements of purpose out of company shareholder resolutions or not? Or they can just ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, me lawyers. I, I mean, I think that's fine. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's, if, you're, if the shareholders have enough oomph, to put that forward and that oomph to get the board to write the purpose. And then, then why not go a whole hog and, and kind of endorse it as either registered, it goes a B corporation or 
you know, because, I mean, I guess it seems like a very door jam by door jam piecemeal approach to what really we're talking about here is a systematic and systemic problem that elevates to the social level for the reasons we've talked about. I mean, I'm not against it. I don't get me wrong. It's not, I think that's great, but I don't think that if the problem we're all trying to solve here is, is what the sociological externalities at a massive scale, climate change, inequality, all the things we're talking about, I think the approach has got to be a more top down than sort of that that bottom up personally. But I don't know, Rick. I mean, you're, you're like, happy to happy to jump in from that perspective. And certainly, you could do it. It just doesn't strike me as a policy that's going to be have a lot of bang for the buck. Yeah. Look, I think I think you're right in the sense that that piecemeal doesn't get there. I think the useful um, thing that shareholder proposals can do is force BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street and other large asset managers to take a stand. So if you're able to put in a resolution, whether it's to become a benefit corporation or to elaborate a purpose or to you know elaborate how you're actually gonna favor stakeholders over shareholders when it's system systemically important or all three of those, I think by, by, by starting with resolutions like that and sort of saying to BlackRock, well, you said that you care about the climate. How is it that you don't actually want to vote for something that will actually push in that direction? I think it can be a useful tool. So, I, Roberto, go ahead, Roberto. Yeah, please. I, I want to say something about shareholder proposals because I think there's another uh, episode that illuminates a little bit two of the three. So, uh, uh, JP Morgan received a shareholder proposal this season about. Uh, the BRT statement. Jamie Dimon was instrumental in getting the BRT statement published and approved. And the shareholder has said, okay, so now tell us what JP Morgan is planning to do to implement this wonderful BRT statement. And the company, of course, tried to get an action letter from the SEC to get the proposal out of the proxy saying, you know, we are, we've been doing, we've been pro stakeholders forever. We are, you know, we don't need to change anything. They literally say that we don't need to change anything to comply with the new statement of corporate purpose. We've been doing this already uh, for for decades. So it's kind of complicated. You know, show the proposal is a great tool. I think uh, uh, we should resist the temptation, which is out there. Uh, to curb and uh, limit the, the, the instrument, but uh, uh, we are back to the, to the key question. Uh, corporate leaders do not really have good reasons to be proactive on these issues, and they will fight small shareholders' proposals as well. So, Roberto, thumbs up or thumbs down on Delaware Public Benefit Corporation? Where are you coming from? Good idea, bad idea. It's complicated. I don't want to. Come wanna on, start. Roberto. There's I, I, nothing worse than a lawyer than a law school down. professor. Thumbs down. Roberto. Okay. Sorry, thumbs down. sorry Rick. Uh, I <laughs> say, you know, it's not that, I, you know, it's a, if I have to choose like drastically, I think it's a thumbs up, but there's a big problem of accountability. And, you know, I'm kind of, uh, I have an obsession about incentives. And if you just, uh, <laughs> put out statements uh, in, in, in corporate documents without uh, uh, keeping, without any mechanisms to keep uh, corporate leaders accountable, uh, you know, it's kind of complicated. I, I have a compromise solution. How about, yeah. will, you give a, will you give an unqualified thumbs up for benefit corporations as long as there's no dual class stock and no classified board so that, so that they're actually accountable to the shareholders for those. Well, I'm, no, I, I'm no fan of those things. I have another paper on what class in the working, so I'm not fan of those things. So we can we can work on that compromise. Okay. Okay. That's good. We can compromise. So there's a interesting question I'll paraphrase from Li Ping Guan, which is essentially um, do you think there's a difference about you know between emerging markets and developed markets around purpose of the corporation, if I've captured that right? Um, do you think emerging market corporations have a different role to play? Do you think purpose means something different in emerging markets to developed markets, or is this discussion we're having really invariant across different types of 
economic regimes. Who wants to pick that up? Maybe Leela, you, you deal with you know companies in all these different markets. Yeah, well, first of all, on the discussion that was just going on, um, I have I, I've noticed that uh, a few of you are, are quite pessimistic, and I realized that I was optimistic today. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the reason I'm optimistic is because my expectations were very low when I saw the BRT statement last year. It didn't quite mean a lot to me because it's just a statement. It was quite easy for uh, it seemed easy uh, to sign. So. It didn't raise a lot of expectations and uh, we're in the business of putting out lots of public statements and, um, um, you know, uh, coordinating these types of, uh, you know, CEOs coming together on different issues. And if you don't have uh, the validation process behind it um, and if you don't have a mechanism to to um, for accountability, then it becomes a meaningless exercise. Um, so, you know, a lot of those things, unfortunately, going around. Um, on emerging markets, um, I, it doesn't seem to me that this debate about the role of uh, corporations in society is as acute in other markets than it is right now in the US. I don't see this happening in other countries. Um, the B Lab movement is quite strong in the US. It's their number one market. Um, they are trying to go global. We actually do have a partnership with them. Um, and it's starting to um, to increase. Uh, but um, I don't see a lot of discussions around um, purpose, perhaps in the European market, uh, but um, it hasn't come to our attention in other in, in emerging markets, um, maybe because, um, you know, there are pressing issues to deal with um, and, um, you know, challenges are different or it's a cultural issue, but it doesn't seem to me that it's, it's as acute as it is here. But on the other hand, the impact that the U.S. market can have on how corporates operate uh, in other countries is really, really big. Uh, so if there is a real momentum around that, um, I'm pretty confident that other countries might follow as well. So we've got one minute left. Um, I'm going to give each of you 15 seconds to tell the audience and each other what your personal priorities are for what you want to get done over the next year to, to address these issues in your role. 15 seconds, personal priorities. Lila, we'll start with you. Personal priorities are climate. Um, no doubt about it, and um, anything to be done on verification, on certification, on you know metrics, um, great adoption at scale of climate um, action. That's uh, that's my priority. Great, thank you, Andrew. Uh, also, also the big priority for the next twelve months is a um, getting a coalition together on the future of work in the U.S. with the labor movement, academics and sponsors and partly framed around some of the claims in the business roundtable statement and part of the winning COVID piece. So that's, that's one of my priorities. Great. Thank you, Roberto. Personal uh, Focusing on incentives. Don't get distracted by rhetoric. That's my priority. Great. Finding the time to finish the book on all this that I've been meaning to write for the last five years would be my personal priority. Uh, the second would be, and not to get us too far down this road, um, working, doing my part to see the political and policy making change in this country that I think will allow for more space uh, for these issues to get to get real, real attention. Rick, how about you? Uh, catalyze, catalyzing a movement of asset owners who will um, impose through withhold votes, uh, real guardrails uh, on corporations to create no-go zones for uh, exploitive profits. Great, well, listen, I want to thank all the panelists for a terrific session. Um, thank all the people who joined. I'd like to thank Grassley for giving us the opportunity to get together and, and have this conversation. Um, we wish you a good afternoon and evening and the rest of the conference this week. And if I had the technological capabilities, I would be plain I put a spell on you as we exit, but I just don't know how to do it. So you just have to pull it up yourself. Credence Clearwater Revival, one of the best 
rock and roll groups of all time. Although the Stones are better. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, everybody. everybody. Bye, guys.